um, it was so funny because Sam Lupo hit me up and they were like, do you want to be part of the video revealing that they're going to name the third floor after BAC and GCX? Yeah. And originally I said, no, have Tim do it because of the rapport between Lupo and Tim. Yeah. But Tim couldn't get out the day that we had to do it. We had to go early. Um, so, uh, we get there and I said to, I said to Lupo, I was like, I was like, man, I was like, I, I I'm just still like dumbfounded that we're here. And uh, he looks at me and he goes, I'm not here if you're not here. Let's just always remember that. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not standing here if you're not standing here. Uh, and it, it was just flattering to me again that I got to be a small part yeah. of, you know, what got us to this point. Welcome to Tardux, a podcast for content creators to come on, share their stories, experiences, and advice. And today I am super excited. I got Kevin Murray. Welcome. Hello. I'm excited too. Yeah, so glad you're here. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot, a lot to talk about. I mean, you wear many hats, so are you ready? Let's do it. All right, so we start off with a few random questions to warm things up. So let's start with best sport to watch in person. Hockey, by far. Absolutely. Not even close. Nope. <laughs> Not uh, even close. What would your wife say is your best meal you make? Um, well, I actually asked her yesterday what she would like me to make this weekend, and she said steak. She likes when I smoke steak on the on our, our smoker out nice. in the back. So a nice seared ribeye. Yeah. Um, smoke it for about an hour and then just sear it in a pan real quick. Oh, nice. All right. And then, you know, you're, you're doing stuff out of the corner of your eye. You catch a TV. The TV's on. What are you stopping? What are you doing? So you could, you know, what catches you and says sucks you in to watch this show or movie? Um, probably Lord of the Rings nine times out of ten. Yeah. Uh, yeah that that had a huge, profound impact on my life, as you can see. That's shards of Narsil oh, tattooed cool. on me. Yeah, I got shards of Narsil. I got the Dawn Treader from Narnia, and then I got Han's pistol. Oh, nice his blaster. That says never tell me the odds. So ah. this is my nerd sleeve. Narnia, what a great, great book and movie. Narnia was my gateway drug to okay. all of all of fantasy and D&D and all that stuff. Um, I grew up a uh, Christian household. Not like everyone else has horror stories. I don't really have horror stories. My mom was pretty uh, open minded. Mm -hmm. um, but Narnia was kind of the gateway to all of the fantasy and sci fi and everything I would enjoy later in life. OK, cool. All right, so let's jump into this. So you, you're, one of your taglines says you're a retired content creator. So before you even hit that go live button, what were you doing? What's your background? Um, I, uh, I, I started later than most. I didn't start uh, broadcasting until I was in my early 30s. Um, I'm in my early 40s now. Uh, but uh, I was in event planning. Um, we did some retail work as well, but event planning was my main uh, source of income for most of my life. I started at 15. Uh, New York City, uh, originally from Long Island, um, you know, worked. I worked so many different events in so many different places in New York and around uh, the New York area uh, for so many different high profile clients. Some I'm not even to this day. I'm not even allowed to talk yeah. about some of the events I did. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've done uh, presidential visits, uh, worked with the mayor, Mike oh, wow. Bloomberg, for the longest time. Um, did EDM festivals, all sorts of stuff, mainly um, from a setup and then food because we were catering as well. Oh, OK, so we did kind of both. Um, and then, you know, we owned some restaurants at some point, some cafes around the city. So uh, it was it was a really interesting time in my life, but it was also the most exhausting and most stressed I ever was. Yep. Uh, the New York hustle and bustle. I, I lived it so. I've moved on to quieter things. Yes, <laughs> yeah. In, <laughs> in in my field, you know, part of my field, but years ago was part of some live AV events and whatnot. And I just mm -hmm. like, it's rush, rush, rush. And you wait until they go live. And then you just, you're sitting on pins and needles because you don't know what could go wrong during that event and then ready to scramble. And then when you're done, it's like, all right, it's just, you're exhausted. Yeah, there there's a satisfaction in completing an event. Obviously, GCX to this day, I, I still torture myself. GCX, though, is more of a personal, um, you know, there's personal goals involved there rather than just getting a paycheck. Yeah. Um, you know, back in the day, it was it was mainly about getting a paycheck and and doing that. But I got I got to live some amazing experiences and see all sorts of stuff. I, I joke all the time because 
you know, I'm like a punk rock kid at heart. So we were doing set up for an event and Warp Tour was right next door. Oh, nice. So I was like, what if I just snuck in the back? So I flashed my fake credentials that didn't apply to Warp Tour. They just <laughs> let me walk in and I went walking around Warp Tour for most of the day. So nice. just, you know, fun little anecdotes over the years and things that I got to do. Um, and, and, you know, made me into the person I am today. So. Yeah. And now, okay, so let's let's go back to video games because video games mm -hmm. is the hook that connects all of my content creators have been on. So, you know, for you, what were some of the early gaming memories for you? I remember getting my NES. I was about eight years old, uh, somewhere around there. I don't yeah. remember the exact age. I remember my stepdad plugging it in and it just being this glorious experience. And all we had was Duck Hunt and Super exactly, Mario Brothers. Yeah. That's it. That's all we had. But, I mean, I think for days we did that. Um, and then, you know, it progresses to SNES and Genesis. I remember my parents were divorced, so dad had Genesis and mom had SNES. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, kind of like sick of the SNES. Like, <laughs> can I spend the weekend with dad? Um, but uh, just stuff like that. And uh, whenever I get asked this question, I always reference Blockbuster video. I don't think there was ever a greater time to to be a gamer um, than, you know, that Friday night going to mm -hmm. Blockbuster, renting your movie with the family, renting your game for the weekend. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, I saw, I think it was Sequisha tweeted the other day about finding other people's save files on games. I was like, oh my <laughs> God, yeah. I remember that. Um, but it really, the community aspect of gaming peaked for me. A lot of people will come and they'll say halo. For me, it was World of Warcraft. Yeah. Um, I joined in Burning Crusade. Uh, I was working at Best Buy uh, at the time alongside of the event planning. And um, all the folks in my computer bar were like, you've never played? And I was like, no. They're like, well, we're going to play the next expansion, but you should try Lord of the Rings Online first. So I didn't even start with WoW. I started with Lord of the Rings oh, Online. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I still, if you look at my desktop in front of me, WoW's there, yeah. Tours there, Elder Scrolls Online, Lord of the Rings Online. <laughs> ben, Professor Broman was on my laptop the other day. He's like, why do you have so many MMOs on your laptop? I was like, <laughs> I, it's, you know, you get the urge. You want to play. So. I'm an old school MMO guy. I love um, that era uh, of of games and yeah. the other odd piece of me. Obviously, Destiny was the one that changed my life. Um, Destiny was is I'll forever love that game dearly. Yeah, actually, we're, I just painted this space because I'm like redoing it. Mm -hmm. And my wife has all of my Destiny one, my Xbox, my uh, PS4, three, whichever PS4 discs for um for Destiny. And I have a poster and she's going to like make a whole oh, thing nice. for it put on the wall so i don't play it anymore yeah. but game will owe it and the community will always have a very 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 special place in my heart because nice. i don't think i'm sitting here talking to you without that game yeah nice yeah going back to your your days of renting games so where i was i'm from newfoundland we had the grocery store rented the whole console so the nes with a couple of games <laughs> and friday night we're there my my friends and i and then we're, you know our parents they didn't see us until sunday essentially Yep. Yeah, yeah, I remember we had a, a it wasn't Electronics Boutique. I forget what it was in Canada. It was the same company. E yeah, the they, EB Games. EB Games. So they moved out of this space and mom and pop shop came in and kept everything like games. And oh, everything. nice. They would rent consoles for dirt cheap. So I remember renting like PlayStation one and then inviting everyone over. Yeah. And we were playing like Twisted Metal and stuff <laughs> like that. So I have same experience. I remember that when I couldn't get a console, my mom would let me rent one yeah. for the weekend. Nice. Uh, so now after video games, you know, what made you hit that go live button? Um, so I, uh, uh, it started with podcasting, not even gaming. Um, I had, uh, found this website where you could make like <clears throat> essentially your own radio show. Yeah. And, uh, I started doing that and playing all my own music cause copyright didn't matter back then. Right. Uh, <laughs> it was just the wild west. <laughs> um, so I started doing that and my friends and family would tune in and then I started getting some other listeners. And then one of my really, really close friends, Rob, was was basically saying, hey, you should you should check out Twitch. It's like that. But you get to play games, too. And so I started watching Towley on Twitch, uh, World of Warcraft. Yeah. I think it was around Mr. Mr. Pandaria time. And um, uh, I was like, what if we did a podcast on Twitch? Because no one was doing that yet. And uh, yeah, let's give it a whirl. So we started this thing, which was called Worst Radio Show, which was back in the day, uh -huh. which is actually how everyone knew me at the beginning of Destiny because that oh, was the gateway into that. Um, so we did that for many, many years until uh, I broke off and started making my own content um, separate from the group that we had because mm -hmm. it was a shared channel. There was um, oh, okay. by four, there was four of us at the time. Um, yeah, and, and that was pretty much it. Downhill from there, I decided to dive in 
Uh, yeah. And man, it was uh, it was interesting at the beginning. Like you get 10 viewers and you're like, oh, my God, this is the coolest <laughs> thing in the world. People want to watch me do this. And, and, you know, seeing where I've been and the places I've gotten to go now, it's just those numbers will always yeah. impress me. But I, I don't think I ever had more fun than I did at the beginning nice. when you didn't care about numbers and you just cut loose. Yeah. And I, I saw on, on you know, LinkedIn, you were also uh, streaming on Mixer. You got, you got sort of signed up or, or moved over to Microsoft's Mixer. Yeah, it was funny. The, um, when, the, when the platform wars began, yeah. Um, we had been negotiating with, I don't have an NDA with them, which is great. I can just talk about whatever I want now. Um, the, uh, they had reached out. They had wanted myself, Professor Broman, and Gathalian at the time. Because oh, we were like okay. the Guardian Con at the time crew, what would uh, become GCX. Yeah. And they really wanted all three of us together. And they could not get to the number that um, collectively we wanted. So they sidebarred with me and said, would you come over for this amount? Yeah. Which was more money than I had ever made streaming. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I talked to them and they were like, go get your bag, dude. So, uh, I signed a contract with mixer for two years. Um, and the first, I would say year was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, I made more money in content creation than I ever have and probably ever will. Wow, that's excellent. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I had a ton of new viewers. I still have community members. Even after a three year hiatus, I have community members from mixer. A, people that stop by and say, it's so good to see you again, or yeah. B, mods and stuff like that, that uh, followed me uh, from Mixer. So Mixer was a very special time. I think it was a great platform. Mm -hmm. I just think they had some really, really bad people running the platform that, that you know, were yeah. not in it for the right reasons. Um, so uh, I decided to actually sever my contract with them um, for a number of reasons yeah. that I won't mention, but... It was a fun uh, eighteen-ish months, nineteen months that I got nice. to uh, do the mixer thing. And then after mix, you you came back to Twitch, and was it much of a rebuild, or your community followed you? So what happened was most most of the people followed me. Uh, my first few months back on Twitch were great, which is and here's the disparity of of your getting a paycheck from a platform versus streaming. Yeah, my numbers were better on Twitch, but my pay was like a fifth or a sixth of what I was previously making on Mixer. Yeah. So I couldn't justify the time investment versus that. Um, and then additionally, uh, Rare Drop at the time was um, COVID would happen, I think, two or three months after I left Mixer. Yeah. Um, so Rare Drop started, the business just started picking up because all of these nonprofits wanted to emulate what we had done with St. Jude. Yeah. Despite us telling them, like, this is like six years worth of work that right. you want to do in two months. But a lot still wanted to keep going and doing it. So we took on new clients. Um, and I came to the conclusion that summer, I was like, I can't do both. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't stream 40 hours a week and then 40 hours a week. I got three kids, a right. wife, like I can't do it. So I, I think after all my sponsored obligations at the fall, I decided to call it quits on streaming, yeah. um, for three years, did a lot of self-reflection would turn it on every so often, say what's up, play a few games. Yeah. And then, uh, in, uh, was it December? It was December of last year. I had a long talk with my wife and I said, I don't really care about the numbers anymore. I don't care about the financials. I just kind of want to go online and interact with people in that yeah. way. So I decided to come nice. back and do it. And I've been doing it like two days a week, three days a week. And I don't, I, I couldn't tell you how many viewers I have, how much yeah. money, because I don't look at it anymore. It just, it's, it's just fun for me. Yeah, exactly. It's your fun. It's, it's an escape from your normal job yep. now. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's just a good time and I really enjoy doing it. So I don't, I don't look at numbers. I just do it and, yeah. I have a PayPal account and that's where all the money goes, but I'm more focused on having a good time. Yeah. Some of the YouTubers that I've had on, that's what they use their Twitch for is really just to escape. This is where they go and have fun. You know, let's just hang out and do their thing. Yep. Yeah. Cause it's, there's some games like hell divers is a perfect example. Yeah. I like playing that with an audience. I don't play it on my own. People are like, you're only level 25. I'm like, yeah, cause I don't play it offline. Uh, I, yeah. I just, I, I enjoy playing with friends and I mm -hmm. enjoy playing with an audience because that game is, the shenanigans that you can create yeah. are fun when people are interacting with you. Yeah. I tried to play it offline, didn't have the same experience, so it's one of my online games. Ah, okay, very cool. And now, when you were you know streaming, mm -hmm. when was the point that you knew you could take this full time and sort of gave up your other like event planning and everything like that, or did you go from basically streaming full time into you know the many hats you're wearing now? Um, so. I, 
GCX itself was uh, was really the only business that Rare Drop had. Yeah, we needed. Ironically, the first after the first event, we um, were contacted by St. Jude that were like, we would like to do more work with you because we had helped raise over half a million dollars with the community, um, and they were like, but we can't just work with three dudes from Florida. We right. need you to be a company. So we, you know, got an LLC and put it together. And then um, if my mom was being interviewed right now, she would be like, well, my son's an entrepreneur, so he can't just sit still, <laughs> um, which is true. I couldn't sit still. I was like, so I went to, at the time it was Corey and Ben, and I said, what else can we do with this company? Like, wh we have this platform. What yeah. else can we do with it? Um, so a, a few years later, we would sign the Tampa Bay Lightning as clients, uh, run all of their esports programs and help them build that side of their business. Um, and then the COVID stuff picked up and that was really the catalyst. It okay. was, it was, it was that, that really changed the game for me that I had to say, like, I have to pick one or the other. I can't do both anymore. Yeah. It's just too much. Um, and then to this day, you know, GCX is, is getting back to where it was pre COVID. I yeah. looked at the hotel pickup numbers yesterday and I was like, oh my God, this is, this is, this feels good again. Yes. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we have a few clients, uh, Tampa Bay Rays are a client now, um, and, and, uh, um, a few other nonprofits and, and, uh, for-profit entities, but the work has kind of shifted to mm -hmm. mostly consulting. Now they want to pick our brains. They want to understand, um, you know, which I never thought uh, like someone would want to do that with me. Right. Uh, but after over 10 years of doing this and then collect almost 30 years event planning experience, I hate yeah. saying that out loud, but you know, there's a lot that I can offer and even Tim and Ben and and Mindy, who no one really knows who Mindy is. She's the enigma. Um, <laughs> uh, there's, you know, that we can offer that. So that was, that was the, the break. It was, the work was coming in mm -hmm. and I couldn't justify, you know, the streaming paycheck right. versus this when this had more upside for the future. Yeah. Okay. And then stepping back, when did you go from your sort of event planning, your normal job before streaming? Like, when did you know you could take that full time? Was that a just increase in numbers or just some events that happened that allowed you to hit those numbers and, okay, making my streaming numbers are, you know, my paycheck there is equivalent to what I was making here. Let's do the cut. So previous, before Mixer, I was streaming 8 or 9 p.m. to like midnight, 1 a.m. every, every I would say, four or five days a week. Yeah. Um, sometimes six, if like a new game launched or something. Yeah. So I was the night evening guy. Okay. And my numbers were very good because of that, because I had the support of a lot of the directory for Destiny at the time. Um, and I would say I was putting in probably 25, 30 hours a week doing broadcasting. And then during the day, I was working rare drop stuff. Yeah. Uh, the mixer contract flipped that. I knew I had to try it. So I was going live at around 8 a.m. Um, uh, during the mixer days and, and getting off like 3, 4 p.m. Yeah. Um, so that was the day job. And then I would get off and check my emails and, you know, write proposals or do whatever I had to do into the evening. Um, and at the time my wife understood, she knew that we had to give this a shot. It was the, the adage where like, if I don't do this, will I regret it? Mm -hmm. So we knew we had to give it a shot. We knew it was a lot on the family, but she gave me the leeway to do it. Um, and I was able to function like that for about 19, 20, like 18, 19, 20 months, something yeah. like that. Um, and, and, and get the work done before nice. we had to start making concessions and, and yeah. whatnot. So, but that was kind of the mixer paycheck justified the hours. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's what, and something I've noticed with a lot of the creators of bond, having that spouse is so supporting spouse is so key to be able to do, you know, your, your dream, your passion and whatnot, especially if you, you know, not many of the creators that I've had on have kids, let alone three kids. That's a heavy load to try to balance it and be successful at. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, many conversations with her but she's always been supportive and you know she's like i never want you to live with regret i never want you to sit there and say what if when you're older so yeah. let's give it a whirl and i gave it the old hefo were there times i thought i could be the biggest thing in streaming of course i think everyone goes through that yeah. um but when you get to the you know 10 years in and you've had the ups and downs maybe it's not about that maybe it truly is about the interaction at the end so i do appreciate my wife's insight into all of this and the support because a lot of the house stuff started to fall on her yeah you know 
but again, I was making double salaries. I was doing very well. It was it was really good time financially for us, but it was a lot of work and a yeah. lot of hours and a lot of times that, you know, I couldn't be in a certain place or help with something. So, yeah, all credit to her, uh, which is funny because now she's going through a shift in her career mm -hmm. and we're having the reverse. Now <laughs> I'm trying to step in as much as I can because she's having this weird shift and what oh. she's trying to do and and it uh, but i feel honored to do that like you did it for me now it's your turn right. let's take care of you and and you get your stuff done and you get go get your bag so nice. um yeah awesome yeah. and now earlier you mentioned ben and Corey, and just for those who don't know who were ben and Corey, mm -hmm. uh professor broman and king Athalian were yeah. the ones who uh started it and then darkness 429 tim came along um Corey stepped away from the business uh during covid um family stuff personal reasons um, uh, but still friends with him. Nice. I started doing the podcast we had with him again a few weeks ago. Um, so, you know, no, nothing bad there. It was yeah. just personal reasons. He yeah. had to step away. And now we, you know, you talked a little bit about, about rare drop. So what is rare drop mm -hmm. for those who don't know? And how did it all come together? Like I said, it started with St. Jude being like, you know, you need to be a business, but essentially rare drop was the company we started um to run gcx yeah. uh that was its only purpose at the time and we've had uh, so many different ideas of what we've wanted to do with it places we want to take it we did content for a while we've done uh uh you know production and events and esports production um we've worked with full sail university we've worked with like i mentioned the sports yeah. teams um but now it really is events production consulting um yeah. kind of settled into our groove um we're, we're doing marketing for a few folks as well yeah uh so it's 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 an interesting mix but it's we've kind of settled into where we are now um and you know all of our different revenue streams yeah. um a few nda things i can't even talk about yet that you'll hear about in the next few nice. two months um so and, and again a lot of that stuff is under gcx so if something branded gcx comes out that's yeah. not the event itself that's still us, okay. you know, that's, but you know, like Dr. Lupo sits on the board with Sam Lupo's wife for yeah. GCX. So they're involved in anything GCX. So GCX was GCX first. And then out of GCX, rare <clears throat> drop was made essentially. So the way this, the, the series of events was in 2015, um, Corey and Ben Gotham Broman decided to have a meetup. Uh, Broman had just moved to Tampa. I was still living in New York at the time. Uh, and I had met Corey earlier that year at Disney, um, uh, randomly. He just happened to be there the no, same no day way. I was there. My kids. Yep. And, uh, he tweeted, you know, does anyone want to get a beer? And I said, sure. And he said, meet me here at this time. We had a beer, we hit it off and then, you know, gave me his number. We were texting and then, uh, you know, found out he lives 15 minutes from my in-laws. Oh, so shoot. yeah. So he was, let's go get a beer. So even after Disney, we went and got a beer. Um, stayed in touch. Um, and then, uh, they were, they were like, Hey, let's, let's, let's have a, a, a meetup or something. So they got the word out with three weeks notice. I had known before uh, and I had planned to be down here. Uh, and they, and a uh, thousand people from around the world show up, wow. various creators, all sorts of people. We got kicked out of the first bar cause it was too full. <laughs> we tried to go to the second bar and they wouldn't let us in cause we had too many people until yeah. we found a bar that had was like, nope, bring them all in. We can do this. Um, so that was the origin of it. The following year, I had moved. Um, people think I moved for this. I did not. I moved because my wife had gotten her dream job. Mm -hmm. She is a, she's an interior designer. Uh, she also studied architecture. So she had a company that wanted to hire her for both. Okay. And we couldn't say no. It was too good for her. Yeah. Uh, so I gave up my career in New York so she could pursue this here um and uh not knowing that content creation was going to take over and it was just a gamble it yeah. really was for us wow. um and and Corey and ben at the time uh really supported my channel to make sure that uh, that financially like i was uh doing so they were pushing me rating me doing everything they yeah. possibly could um but after i moved down here early that next year we were at dinner one night and Corey said you have event planning experience right i said yeah and he was like can we turn the thing that we did last year into like an event? Mm -hmm. And I said, if you give me money, I can do it. I can't do it for free. <laughs> right. Like, so we did it on a shoestring budget the first year. Destiny Community Con is what it's called. That's yeah. actually the poster for it right there. Nice. Um, and uh, uh, 
we had creators again come from all around the world we had 3500 in attendance we had 1500 people waiting outside to get in wow uh, it was wild it was insane um and i i still to this day cannot believe the the budget that i pulled that off on yeah. given the budgets i have now and right what i had in the past like i to this day i can't believe it um oh but we made it happen and it worked and it was really diy and really really ghetto but yeah. it worked everyone oh. had a great time and now in your opinion what sets you know gcx apart from other gaming events or you know community events meetups and things like that so um and and more are, are sprouting up um but uh a lot of it has to do with our relationship with creators i think an event started by creators mm -hmm. um we look at things through a different lens um our goal is not necessarily how many bodies can we fit in this room our goal is how can I have a unique and enhanced experience for everybody that comes into this room? Yeah. So our philosophy with GCX, obviously the charitable part, um, obviously the community part, but I want experience to be part of the pillars that we build this on. So yeah. I tell people, it's great that you enjoy yourselves from 10 or 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. when you're on our floor. My concern is that when your plane touches down or your car pulls into, you know, the parking lot of I-4, uh, that you can you will have a great experience until your plane leaves or your car pulls out again. Yeah. That, that piece of it, the event itself is just a piece of the puzzle. I want to make sure the end to end experience is positive and yeah. good and that you have a great time um, and really foster that community. The other side of it is the creators. Like I said, the relationship we have yeah. with them because creators sit on our board. Uh, this is actually not even, this will be announced here publicly <laughs> for the first time. Uh, we just started an advisory board and it's made up of industry professionals and creators so we can get an outside perspective. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, like I'm, I'm 41. Uh, the other guys are getting older, yep. except Tim. Tim. Tim's forever young. <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted a different perspective. I can't have my finger on the pulse forever. And I really feel like I haven't had my finger on the pulse for the last few years yep. because, you know, the things I enjoy are not what's popular anymore. So right. I want to make sure that I'm having those conversations with people that are in it yep. uh, and we've already we've had one meeting and we've already had some really really good feedback so the folks that are on that will be announced you'll probably see it very soon yeah. on socials oh excellent um but yeah so the re creator relationship um i would say we want a really fun vacation experience that gives you a comic con-esque way to meet your creators but not have you pay 30 dollars for a photo yeah um, after you paid for an entry, you know, to come into right. an event. Nice. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of what sets it apart. And then obviously the relationship with St. Jude, like, um, th they're such a huge part of what we do. Yeah. They're an event partner. They're not just someone we fundraise for that sits in the background. They're active in what we do. We have a discord chat. I've been chatting in with them all day. Um, you know, uh, I was just in, in Vegas over Super Bowl weekend with Jason from St. Jude play live. Um, we went to Madden bowl to you know discuss opportunities with folks there yeah so there's lots of ways they get involved that people don't even know about but part of the reason that uh, gcx is successful is because saint jude is involved in it yeah and so when did the whole charity sort of aspect come into gcx you know when did that what brought that about so at the same dinner where corey said you know, can we make it into an event? Ben brought up, you know, I'd love to give back and do something, you know, for charity. Yeah. And Ben, Ben comes from the GDC community. So he was very familiar with the speed runners and all this stuff and the great folks, um, who, who run GDC. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, not GDC, GDQ. GDC is game developers conference. I'm talking about games done quick. GDC was this week. I got, got on the break. <laughs> um, so GDQ, uh, uh, that's where he, he, you know, knew. So he took ideas from that, created his own format and style for what became, would become our marathon. Um, and I remember him saying like, we're going to raise half a million dollars this year. I was like, are you crazy? Are you <laughs> half a million dollars? You're nuts, dude. I was like, if we hit a hundred thousand, I'll be so happy. And he proved all of our asses wrong and he's done it time and time again. Yeah um and yeah the the rest is history we just kind of went off from there and we've had so many poignant moments with fundraising that they're just too difficult to count at this point uh, and, and speaking of memorable moments you know gcx places a strong emphasis on community and charitable charitable giving what are some of those moments that you know some of the bigger ones that stick out for you that that you know changed your view or affected you personally my personal favorite thing for the live event is when i'm walking around um 
uh, and less people know who I am now because I'm not like streaming 40 hours a week, yeah. which works for me to be honest, because I can do my job and you know maneuver the floor pretty easily. But uh, I love hearing people meet for the first time that have played video games together yeah. for a long time. It's probably my favorite thing, uh, and it happens every year. Um, you know, this is my wife, this is my kids, this is my boyfriend, <laughs> like whatever it is. That, those moments are special because you know you think back to Halo. And there's TikTok videos of of you know like I flew my husband's Halo mm -hmm. friend out who he's been playing with for ten years, and you know they have a million views, and I'm like that happens like 10, 20 times a day <laughs> in GCX. Right. Uh, and it's just it's really special that that we were able to create the vehicle to bring those people together. Yeah. Um, and 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 that's also one of the reasons that we really try and put the family emphasis on it. Like bring your kids, bring your spouse, bring your significant other, whatever it may be. Yeah. Because we want that door to be open for the older folks who like, I don't know if I can get away from my family for a week to right. go to a PAX. No, bring them all. Go to Disney, go to Universal, have fun. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of the reason we stay in Orlando, too, is because it gives us the ability to, um, you know, facilitate that family vibe. But yeah. that's one of the that's one of my favorite things. Um, uh, my favorite charitable moment um, is Lupo coming just shy of a million in in like five hours. Yeah. I think it was 2019 or 20. Yeah, I, I want to say it was 2019. Um, that just blew my mind from the guy that like did an overnight and raised four thousand dollars just a few years earlier mm -hmm. to that so quickly um yeah it's great and <clears throat> you know this day i only get to see him a few times a year but yeah. he truly is is he's so passionate uh about the cause and what mm -hmm. we do and and you know it's just it's it's incredible. I admire the way he goes about that, and I'm happy to be a part of yeah. the team that makes it come alive. Yeah, and St. Jude's is such a fa fascinating, uh, fantastic, you know, charitable organization, and especially once you have kids, it you know that just hits you differently. Yeah, yeah. It's St. Jude. I think I think the thing that impressed me most is what most people don't know. Yes, they are actively assisting kids who are fighting horrendous and terrible diseases. But there's so many layers to that. Um, for instance, their labs publish a paper on cancer every 11 hours, and that is free use. Anyone in the world can use their findings. They're not. Do they patent them? Yes, that's because they're slimy, you know, healthcare right. people mm -hmm. trying to you know usurp them. But you can use their patent to develop X, Y, and Z. Yeah, they just had a breakthrough recently, which was so cool because um, one of our community members, all time Brianna, who works there. Yeah, she's been um, on the pod. Yeah, so Brianna was part of the breakthrough that oh, they nice. experienced. Yeah, and it, it's just moments like that are just absolutely incredible and and astounding. That we again, we I I Kevin have gotten to play a very small role in you know the development of this. Um, when people are like, "Oh, you raised you know a million I'm like, "No, I didn't raise. I built the car. They put the key in the ignition and right. they drove the car. <laughs> That's what we do." Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, just that sort of thing is incredible to me. And um, the quality of life is probably the thing that has stuck with me the most as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, when I would fundraise uh, back in the day, one of my biggest takeaways um, and what I still to this day teach all nonprofits, not just St. Jude, but anyone fundraising, I'm like, find the thing that sticks to you because that's how that's the thing you're going to speak most passionately about when you're fundraising. Yeah. And for me, it was quality of life. So, for instance, um, these kids, if I tear up, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, these kids, you'll bring um, me with you. So <laughs> the, the kids, uh, they don't disrupt their education. St. Jude will contact their school and make sure that they have all of the correct curriculum that they are learning in their school district to keep up, to make sure when oh, wow. they are. Yeah. When they're, when they're cured, they go back. They didn't skip a beat. Yeah. They're still on it. They're not behind a year or anything like that. Um, Little uh, things, for instance, they do a prom for the seniors, for the older kids. Oh, no way. <clears throat> yep, and Estee Lauder comes in and does all the makeup. Uh, Men's Warehouse does all the tuxedos. Yeah. Uh, Vera Wang comes in and fits the girls for the dresses. Oh, they have a wig, professional wig maker that works in Hollywood that does all the wig. It's the little things that people really don't acknowledge. They think it's like, oh, they're just helping kids with cancer. I'm like, no, they're giving them their life back. Yeah. And as a parent, that'll punch you in the gut. Oh, so that's 100%. Yeah. I mean, like that's that's really what sticks for me is is uh, I'm going next month for summit. I think it's my ninth or tenth time there, 
you learn something new every time. I mean, last when we were there for Build Against Cancer, um, it was so funny because Sam Lupo hit me up and they were like, do you want to be part of the video revealing that they're going to name the third floor after BAC and GCX? Yeah. And originally I said, no, have Tim do it because of the rapport between Lupo and Tim. Yeah. But Tim couldn't get out the day that we had to do it because we had to go early. Um, so uh, we get there and I said to, I said to Lupo, I was like, I was like, man, I was like, I, I'm just still like dumbfounded that we're here. And uh, he looks at me and he goes, I'm not here if you're not here. Let's just always remember that. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not standing here if you're not standing here. Uh, and it, it was just flattering to me again that I got to be a small part yeah. of, you know, what got us to this point. Yeah. Even when I'm talking to people from a business perspective and they're explaining the business, I'm like, did you ever hear of Dr. Lupo's fundraising? Oh, yeah. I was like, well, that's us. We're a part of that. Yeah. So it opens doors to you. And, and it's just, yeah, it's just awesome. Awesome. And that third floor thing, it just to this day, it just blows my mind. Ah, I can't believe that that's at amazing. All. From, you know, from gamers, from, you know, and, the charity, the charity, or the charitableness of gamers today is just—it's phenomenal. I, and I think it's because we've all, you know, all of us who grew up with gaming at seven or eight years old. Now we're adults. We have jobs, and now we can, you know, give back. It's no longer gaming is that frowned upon thing. It's it's a way to, you know, get a career, help people out, and things like that. The willingness of of the community, and even new people who come to the community to to do something and it's like i can't give what do i do yeah. that line alone should should be some sort of case study in america when you know the tagline our hashtag for gcx is gaming does good yeah and i have been in interviews on the news i've been in things where i'm like the stigma that you have heard is wrong i was <laughs> 2019 eight no 18 i was at the volvo dealership getting my wife her new car and I'm sitting here and the lady behind me is getting a car too. And she's talking to salesperson. She's like, oh, I just took my son to this event called Guardian Con. It was so great. They raised money for, and it was just, I just sat there like a fly on the wall. And my oldest daughter's just going like this to me. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, stop making it obvious. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's just, it, again, it, it, God, I, I could go on on that one. But yeah, it's just, it's, uh, it's yeah. amazing. It and really to think, is. you know, 20 years or 15 years earlier, you know, you're whispering at the water cooler when you find somebody who games because it was sort of like as an adult, oh, you're, you're kind of weird if you play video games to where we are yeah. now. It's amazing. And we're the generation that never stopped. Yeah. You know, we're the ones who just, we got our NES and that was it. It was game over from there. No pun yep. intended. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we're the generation that never stopped. Um, and I really try and press upon my kids because my daughter's an Overwatch player. My son is a Fortnite player. My daughter, youngest daughter is a Bluey. That's her game right now. Yeah. Bluey and the pig. Um, <laughs> but uh, even within that, I really try and impress upon them. I was like, you can do something with this, but please do other things. Don't just play games. So my son's in Taekwondo, the little one's in ballet. The oldest one wants to be a tattoo artist. That's her goal. Yeah. Uh, so she's taking art classes and all that stuff. But I really try and differentiate the drives to make sure that, you know, they're well-rounded because yeah. I had music, I had events, I had things like that, that really made me, you know, into the person I am today. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the stigma in society is that like, Oh, you just sit in your bedroom and play video games all day. Right. Ignoring the social aspect, ignoring, you know, the conversations I have, I have had more conversations about my history with music um, on stream the mm -hmm. past two weeks than I have in years. People are so like, oh, you know, you saw this band, you're friends with this band. Yeah. And it's just like so cool to have the worlds collide and come together. And then my music friends are like, you're friends with Dr. Lupo? <laughs> you're friends with Darkness 429? So you get it on the other side, too. So right. it's really interesting to see, you know, that. But that's that's what society gets wrong is they don't understand what our our hobby and our passion and how that is translated into good things. Yeah. Have people done terrible things? While gaming, yes, people do terrible things when they watch TV, watch movies. I could go on yes, and on and absolutely. on and on and on. Yep. It has nothing to do with the game at the end of the day. No. Um, just going back a bit uh, for the, you know, the build against cancer and some of the some of the people that are involved with that are phenomenal. And they, they've been on the pod like Brick and Nick, Pool Shark, and just phenomenal people who are very charitable and just giving to their communities for, you know, better, you know, good causes. Yeah, yeah. And Nick has, Nick has been a 
GCX community member since I think the first event he was there. Yeah. Um, so we've known Nick forever, um, played destiny with him back in the day. Uh, so he, he'll be, I believe he's coming back to GCX this year. <laughs> he hasn't missed one yet. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a, he, he's great. He's a, he's just a solid person who he's getting married soon. Yes, he is. Yeah. Um, which is exciting, but yeah, Nick, Nick is awesome. Um, I was really happy to see him win the, uh, the Lego show on Fox. Well, he was on the podcast in between the announcement of him winning. So he couldn't, yeah, you know, he didn't say, and it was just like, it was so neat to see the outcomes. And I texted him after it was, I was like, you couldn't tell me that. Yeah. But yeah, it was so cool, <laughs> you know, for, for a Canadian, a fellow Canadian to win that. It was pretty neat. Yeah. Nick's great. And pool's awesome. I'm sad he's leaving Florida, but I know why he's leaving yeah. and, and you know, it's, it's what's best for him and his family. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people that misunderstand pool and yeah. it's like, he's a grizzled old veteran. Like that's <laughs> right. just who he is. He's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Yeah. But, um, I get along with him well because we both have very dark senses of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Build Against Cancer, I can't even repeat it on your podcast, but That's some of right. the jokes in the van with him and and, and Trip uh, <laughs> were, oh. were uh, they were, and Ames was in there with the car with us. Yeah, we were telling some pretty <laughs> dark jokes in there, so uh, good fun, good fun. Yeah, Ames is another one that's been on. It's just a phenomenal human being. You know, it's just, you, you've surrounded yourself or you're part of a, a wonderful, you know, group of people. Yeah. I'm I'm the I'm the guy that nobody knows who I am. Yeah. That's and I like it that way. Uh I'm the friend that every that, like all the broadcasters know who I am, but the audience really doesn't, aside mm -hmm. from like my community and and you know, Goth's community obviously yeah. knows me very well after 10 years. Um, so uh I like it that way though. I don't want to be the focus. I've never wanted to be. I haven't been on stage at GCX since before COVID because I don't want to be. Right. I have to be this year for something, and I'm like, <laughs> oh. But um, oh. it's just not my nature. I'm not the person that likes the spotlight. I yeah. like to sit back and admire the hard work that we did and let it play out. You're that event manager just wants to see, you know, and just in the background making sure everything goes smoothly, and that's that's yeah. your your thing you enjoy. Yeah, that's yep. I love that more than anything. Yep. The, and even the NDA project we're working on, um, I brought it to the team. I connected everybody. Uh, I made it come alive. And then they're all doing the fun part, the creative part. And my hands are back and I sit in meetings with my camera off and nice. just listen to them do it. And I get I love that. Yep. I love that I was able to facilitate the opportunity and let them go nuts on it. Nice. And now, you know, looking forward, you know, what are your aspirations or, or goals for future GCX? And, you know, how do you envision, you know, the event evolving in the coming years? Yeah, emphasis on the vacation aspect. Yeah. I really want an end-to-end -end solution for folks to have a good time. A full experience. Um, like you're saying, you get off the plane and right till you end, wait till you leave. That's all GCX. Yeah, I mean, people go to the theme parks anyway. People do all this stuff anyway. How do we create more ways and avenues for people to be able to have one solid vacation that involves all of the people that will be attending the event? And, you know, it makes it easier for community to gather in those situations. Yeah. Um, and that's the goal, is I really want to make it a place. And I don't want to be PAX. I've never wanted to be PAX. I don't want to be DreamHack. I don't yeah. want to be any of those. Um, you know, how do we make the the... Almost like Tim says this all the time, the cruise on land. Yeah. You know, because a lot of people don't like cruising. So mm -hmm. cruise on land where, you know, we gather, we have our space, we have our time. And then even when we disperse to other places outside the floor, we're still together. We're still doing the fun stuff. We're yeah. still, you know, being able to laugh and have a good time. Because that, to me, when you build community, that's one of the most important pillars of it. It's not just, you know, how many people are in my chat. Um, you know, what are we talking about in chat? There needs to be that. And we learned that during COVID. I think we need the physical, mm -hmm. you know, the hugs, the high fives, Absolutely. the glasses clanking, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, the meals that's important. And I think it's more important than ever in a post COVID world oh, that we have that interaction. So I want to be the facilitator of that within the, the gaming community space. I'm never married to a platform. We don't bleed purple or anything like that. Right. So I don't give a damn where you stream. Just come hang out, have a good time, yeah. invite your community and let's all just, nice. you know, raise money for St. Jude and hang out and have a good time. Love it. And now, you know, as if, you know, that's not enough to keep you busy along with rare drop. There's also King's coast coffee that, yep. <laughs> what's the story behind King's coast coffee? 
Um, we we were trying to work with another coffee company for a number of projects, not just GCX, um, and it didn't work out numerous times. Um, so I, two of my friends in New York, I turned around to them and I said, "How hard would it be to start our own coffee company? Like, what what would it take?" One of them was a manager for Starbucks for many years, so he laid it out. Yeah. The other one was an executive chef for um, uh, a few restaurants in New York. Um, and, uh, we were like, all right, let's take the plunge. So we utilized what we had in the gaming world yeah. to sell the coffee, to start off the company. Um, <clears throat> we launched it on the day destiny two came out, which was also strategic Okay. and stupid, but we, we did it anyway. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that was, that was it. It just kind of flew from there and we've had so many opportunities outside of gaming included we've worked with fitness influencers we got to work with the new york islanders for a few oh, years shoot. um and they still call us like they're like hey can you do coffee pop up in the parking lot for this game yeah okay yeah um so um king's coast is more of the at this point it's the retirement plan yeah it's the 401k <laughs> um uh but it's it's uh, what was once just a roastery in a garage. I mean, we have a, a 7,000 square foot warehouse on Long Island. Wow. Um, there's a cafe you can visit if you're in the area uh, and, and grab a coffee there um, and, and see all my friends yeah. who work there. But um, yeah, it's, it's Kings coast is it's evolving. Yeah. Um, and we really want to take some of the concepts uh, that we've been working on. Uh, we have the dream for, um, a retail concept that mimics the cafe with mm -hmm. some adjustments and changes, um, regional distribution. So we're not shipping everything from long Island. Yeah. Um, you know, to my EU friends, again, I apologize. You can blame the UK and VAT for why we don't <laughs> ship there anymore. Hopefully we'll get a warehouse in there somewhere and don't give me the Amazon thing. They take like 30% of our money that we can't afford as a small business. So, right. and now what is sort of unique about Kings coast that separates it from, you know, other coffee? The taste by far. Um, so we roast to order. So if you ordered coffee today, what's today? Thursday, it wouldn't get roasted until Monday because today was a roasting day. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, it's fresh. We mark the date. It's roasted on your bag. Uh, the stuff you buy on the shelves, it's been it's been roasted two or three months earlier. I'm okay. not saying that's a terrible thing. Yeah. But there's something about fresh coffee that just hits right. Um, so uh, yeah, it's the freshest of the coffee. Wayne has dialed in every recipe. So he's the one who is an executive chef. So mm -hmm. taste profile flavor is very important to him. Um, he's always researching new and different ideas and blends and ways we can do it. But we've we've really gotten it to a point where the taste it's ruined coffee for me. Yeah. Like if I'm on the road or or I I was in Vegas like I said a, a few uh, for Super Bowl weekend and coffee was a nightmare because it was like all right I'll get Starbucks again. <laughs> um, so it's 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 just kind of ruined all other coffee for yep. me um, because of the taste profile okay. and whatnot. So I believe it's that. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's all a right. taste. It really, yeah. that's what it boils down to. Any any particular flavor you enjoy and any flavors coming out that, you know, you're looking forward to? We just dropped uh, our spring one, uh, Spring Surge. Um, Winter Waves is done. Um, so, um, so that's out. My personal favorite changes all the time. Um, uh, if you, it, the one that's easiest to try, if you're just starting out is the Aztec, it's a very low acidity. So a lot of people don't react well to certain roasts and whatnot, or they want to build up their tolerance over time. Uh, so it's the perfect gateway to just kind of get started with coffee. Okay. If you're drinking coffee. like i don't know if you're familiar with uh, his sports streamer uh mills chris mills he never drank coffee ordered king's coast on my recommendation and now he's like i hate you you turn me into a coffee drinker <laughs> and that was the, that was the roast okay. I, I had yeah because i'm a tea him. drink i've never enjoyed coffee it's just too bitter for me and so maybe i gotta give that a shot then I'm going to send you a few bags of Aztec and let <laughs> you let me know how you feel. All right, when, there when we go. Done. <laughs> and now, you know, I, again, with Rare Drop, GCX, Kings Coast, there's also Phoenix Down. So Phoenix Down, uh, at the time we were managed by a company. Um, the company had to shut down due to some misconduct um, uh, allegations, I yeah. should say, because legally there was no trial or anything like that. So misconduct allegations. Um, 
and that was a talent agency that all of us were using at the time. Yeah. Uh, so some of the really talented people that worked there, um, needed, you know, wanted to start something new. So we were having long discussions with them. We decided to be their primary, primary investor, um, and went to get them going and yeah. we did that. And, uh, they have their ability to sign people and create revenue is astounding. Um, they're so successful right now. I'm really happy with the work they're doing. Uh, I get to sit on the board, so I get to to chat with them biweekly and then yeah. quarterly board meetings. Um, but <clears throat> now what yeah, is Phoenix, it? I guess let's back up. What is Phoenix down? Phoenix down is a talent agency within our space. So, um, Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, at the time, Facebook, yeah. wherever you're broadcasting, but essentially that, yeah, that's what it is. It, uh, it, it it's for talent within the content creation space. Mm-hmm. I don't even want to limit it to gaming. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, it's really great to see those folks um, grow. Yeah. Janessa, their CEO, is someone I've known from Destiny community since 2016. Um, someone that was at the first Destiny Con. So, yeah. yeah, it's again, it's another opportunity that we had to be a part of something special. And we dove in and couldn't be happier with the work they're doing. And, uh, you know, Tim is managed by them. Broman's managed yeah. by them. My name is Bife is man- managed by them. Cream is managed by them. I'm trying to think of more folks that are escaping me. 8-Bit Music, I believe. Uh, yeah. Go to phoenixdown.co. You can yeah. look at their whole roster. Also, not even everyone's up on the roster because they're getting <laughs> a new website done. Rapid Reacts on TikTok. He's one of the, uh, he's the gaming news guy that probably everybody knows who he is at this point. Okay. And now, in you know, what makes an ideal ca- uh, creator for Phoenix Down? When it comes to talent agencies, it is about numbers. You know, I hate being that guy to yeah. deliver that message, but it is about numbers because the, the pie needs to be spread out enough for everyone to get a piece of it. Now, they have two ways they work with folks. They can do it in a managerial capacity where, you know, they kind of manage all of your affairs when it comes to that. Yeah. Or it's it's more of an agency world where they're just bringing you deals and, yeah. and, and things like that. So there are two sides to the coin, and they're pretty open. Um, they took some of the practices we didn't like from the former company that, that we were working with and, and kind of threw those out the window yep. and experimented with um, newer concepts that make it more free for the creator to kind of do what they need to do and mm-hmm. not be so restricted. So the innovation there, I think, has helped a lot of creators um, uh, come alongside and, okay. and work with them in a, in, a, in a capacity that they're comfortable with. All right. And then on the flip side of that, you know, in your opinion, when should a creator start looking for representation or, you know, to work with a, an agency? Um, if you are fielding brand deals on your own, uh, whether that be sponsorships or, um, you know, sponsored streams, uh, and you're getting more than I would say two or three a month, yeah. it would probably be good to look into an agent because that means they can probably help you grow to five or six. Yeah. Um, I don't say CCV because I think CCV is on the verge of going away. I think total views is what's going to take over that at some point. Yeah. Uh, X Twitter has already made the move to total views. You can't see, I don't believe you can see a concurrent viewership. I just think you see an overall viewership on their live streams. Um, and that, that number is more important than how many people are watching you at any given moment. Yeah. Um, so I believe that's going to take over in the future. So don't worry about your CCV worry more about, are you able to get deals? And if you are able to get deals, that might be the time to start looking okay. for representation. Excellent. And now something I, I, you know, since, you know, starting to interview and, and talk to creators, something that I don't know if they know enough about because, you know, a lot of them are younger and whatnot is, you know, and you know, yourself, you're in your forties, you know, 401k planning for retirement, uh, sick days, vacation days that you have from normal jobs. Where does, you know, where do you think something should be in place to help those creators? Is it the agency level or something separate, like, you know, from the platforms themselves start offering something like, you know, 401k or sick days, vacation days. I'm an entrepreneur, so I manage my affairs personally. That's yeah. a that's a Kevin thing. So I was able to sock away money that if I got sick for a few days or something like that, those would be my, I would take it from my own bit. So the way my business was structured back in the day, it's not this anymore just because yeah. I don't have the frequency, was I had an LLC and I got paid from the LLC and my wife got paid from the LLC for all the clerical work she did for me and graphic design and stuff like that. 
So there was enough money in the LLC that if I needed to take a day off or do something like that, I would still get the same salary because we were saving money for taxes, putting money aside for other things and whatnot. Yeah. So a lot of it, I think, comes down to personal ability to manage finances um, or hiring someone to help you with that. There are people that specialize in our industry that um, financially <clears throat> can uh, help you manage your, your finances and and. Almost, I don't want to say like a financial planner. They're more yeah. of a CPA or an accountant or something, but they're, they'll give you advice on what to do. Yeah. Um, I had to teach my CPA about the business, and now <laughs> that he understands everything, he's able to help me. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the LLC route worked really well for my family. It might not work best for you. Yeah. When it comes to the collective good, um, the age of contract is going away, so things are only going to get more isolated yeah. not we're not moving to a place where everyone's going to get paid i know someone's going to bring up kick i don't think kicks business model is sustainable whatsoever yeah. there's no if twitch isn't making money kick has got to be bleeding money yeah um especially because kick uses twitch servers to stream <laughs> right and those are owned not by cheap, amazon yeah. which i'm sure twitch is getting at a discount and kick is not yeah. So simple math would, would dictate that that's not going to last. So get your bag while you can. I can't emphasize that enough. If you're streaming on kick and you're making money and that's what you're doing, but diversify yourself, get yourself to multiple platforms. Cause that's allowed now. Like don't, don't put all your eggs in that one basket, Yeah. but get your bag if that's how you're getting it. Um, but <clears throat> I think a lot of it has to do with collectives. Um, you know, there's always talk of unionization and things like that. I don't know if it works in an industry full of independent contractors. Right. I really don't. Um, and I'm not saying that from a functional standpoint. I'm saying that from a reality standpoint. I just don't know if that is the key and the answer. So you might want to think about starting collectives. If you have 10 successful streamers that band together, and there used to be a lot of these back in the day, like yeah. Nerd Fusion was a great example. They all got a salary based on what they were bringing in on sponsorship deals and viewership and all that stuff. And I know it, it's not sustainable forever, but neither is content creation. Right. So like you said, get if your you bag when you can. Right. And if you don't want to do it solo the way I did it and you want to work with other people and have, you know, uh, healthcare benefits and things like that, um, explore what a collective would look like in paying into a collective. Cause if healthcare is a big question, you know, if you all pay into a collective, you can get healthcare at a discount as opposed to a single, you right. know, I'm fortunate enough to get it through rare drop through yeah. my business, but not everyone is in that is in that space. So, yeah. um, yeah, always look at those options of what does it look like if I work together with other people, pool the money, and then, you know, maybe someone's in charge of clerical, someone's in charge of, or you hire someone else to manage all of that stuff. But again, we're talking at a level that, you know, Right. You had to be making a certain amount of money to be able to do something like yep. that. And that's less than I think it's point zero one percent. I'm I don't make that much money off streaming and I don't know what my numbers are. I know they're not like I'm not in the hundreds. Yeah. But I can tell you right now that I'm still in the less than one percent on Twitch. Yeah. Um, just to give perspective on that that number. So yep. and you know, that's Something uh, you saw, you had the foresight that, you know, being a creator, you needed to do more than that. You needed to, you know, diversify or find other avenues of revenue. And I think that's something important that, you know, current day creators need to be aware of. You know, they can't be streaming for the next 15 years and just do that. Yeah, I think uh, someone like Amaranth is a genius. She's buying gas stations and retail space. You cannot go wrong with real estate. Yeah. If you get the kind of money in streaming where you can invest in real estate, do it tomorrow. Um, real estate is the one thing that will hold its value for the most part. Yeah. Um, over time. Um, but yeah, fine. I, I, I was at a, I was actually working a conference years ago. And, uh, so one of the speakers said like most people that are millionaires and billionaires have up to seven streams of income. Yeah. No one really gets the one, Right. income that just pays for everything so you do have to hustle you do have to see what's going to work yeah. and i think one of my biggest missteps in streaming was the constant need to outdo what i did the day before and i would my advice to people would be focus on sustainability not growth yeah i know that sounds backwards <laughs> but sustainability will foster growth if done correctly um 
and uh that's where your head should be at don't try and outdo it we go through this with fundraising you know yeah. we have to tell ourselves every year like it's better that we raise 1.5 to 2 million dollars and try and get to four again just because the state of the world right. doesn't allow us to get there so yeah sustainability is far more important than growth in my opinion so that would yep. be my all right all right so another thing that you know i recently saw that you're part of is heart support that is brand new. Yes, I decided I wasn't busy enough. So. <laughs> I uh, uh, they had actually come to us uh, for work. It's a rare job, and their budgets were were uh, low for the project that they were working yeah. on. Um, and and Mindy, our our COO, VP of Marketing, came to me, and she was like, "I think you should offer to do this personally for them." And um, for those that don't know what Heart Support is, Heart Support is a nonprofit. It's mostly in the heavy metal scene. So it was started by the singer of the band August Burns Red, Jake oh, okay. Lurz. Um, And Jake is the uh, founder of Heart Support. But basically, um, they provide mental health support to people who, who need it, with the focus being on you know the heavy metal scene and working with bands and things like that. They have done stuff in gaming. They have a really good relationship with uh, Kip Boga um uh on twitch and uh they want to branch more out into gaming so um i got on the call with with jake and nate who's um uh works for them as well and you know, they were like well we're starting an advisory board would you be interested in doing that and i said sure i would nice. love to i think that would be a fun way so no time commitment or anything like that yeah. but i chat with nate i was actually that's why i was doing right before you messaged me i was talking to nate uh, from heart support, but, yeah. um, I really want to help them build something in our space. I love the idea of the, the, um, the crossover between music and gaming, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people like me that like that type of music yeah. that are broadcasters, um, and can really do some good here. So, you know, not going to poach from St. Jude or anything. Right. There's plenty to go around or you can do more than one, yep. but mental health is very, very, very important, um, to me mm -hmm. and, uh, their services are pretty stellar and, you know, getting a peek behind the curtain, they need the help to continue providing that to yeah. people and to grow because the need is growing. And Absolutely. when the need is growing, you have to meet the demand, you know? So yeah. it's, it's definitely an honor to be asked to do that. And that team is just, I, I really, really, I've, I've only been in two or three meetings with them so yeah. far, but I've, I've enjoyed what I got to do so far. Excellent. And again, you know, all the other things, this is a fun one. Now you're part of is your podcast with Tim and the star Wars and scotch podcast. Yeah, that's, that's our, our passion project at this point. Um, it, it was funny because it started as, as when rare drop was like a content house. Yeah. We were like, let's do a, a show where we review television shows um or movies and we'll call it spoiler cast so the first season of mandalorian was under spoiler cast we knocked it out of the park we had a great time we were like oh star wars then we tried to do witcher yeah that was a disaster <laughs> tim and i didn't have enough to talk about yeah. we didn't know enough about the lore so then tim came back and he was like what if we just did star wars and the question at first was, is there enough in the happening in Star Wars to justify a weekly show? Yeah. So we said, eh, let's give it a whirl. And yes, some weeks are slow and we don't yep. have something to talk about and that's okay. But this was prior to the boom of Disney shows. Oh, okay. So we were fortunate enough that Disney was like, we're going to make an ass load of television right. shows uh, about Star Wars. Um, and uh, things have just kind of gone off since there. Nice. Um, and we've, yeah, we've and we've gotten to know other Star Wars creators, which I yeah. think is my favorite part. Um, Alex and Molly from Star Wars Explained are really have gotten to know them over the years. They've mm -hmm. been at GCX the last two years. Oh, cool. Um, uh, uh, Darth Chaco from TikTok and um, Chase, that gay Jedi. Oh my God, he they are so much fun. Yeah, to be around. We had them out for uh, for GCX this year, uh, and it was it was a blast. It was a blast. Okay. So I. I like the real Star Wars fans that are in the community. I don't care if you don't like movies. Mm -hmm. I don't like The Phantom Menace, aside from Duel of the Fates. I don't like Attack of the Clones. I think they're really bad movies. Uh -huh. But it's part of my favorite, one of my favorite universes, so I watch them still. They're there, still. yep. Yeah. yeah, so um, I think if you take Rose and Finn out of Episode 8, it's not, it's, it's not too bad. It's, it's right. pretty, pretty good. Yes. Pretty good. 
Um, <laughs> so there's just stuff like that. And, and, but I'm, I am very much a person and Tim is as well, where, you know, like what you want to like, don't, don't crap on my fandom. Right. Um, uh, and, and let's debate in, in good fun when we don't like something or like something, yeah. let's have fun with it. Let's not, you know, uh, I'm looking at all the reviews from the acolyte trailer mm -hmm. and I'm like, how did you ascertain this opinion from a minute and 45 seconds? Exactly. Yep. It just doesn't make sense to me. Like give the show a shot. So right. I know there's just, and it's not just star Wars. It's star Trek. It's Lord of the Rings. It's so many different fit. It's yep. dragon ball. It's just, it's just the way people are and the growth of the internet, but I love star Wars. It's, near and dear to me uh it's it's uh, i just i could talk about it all day <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it's just great speaking of drought i lived through the drought of return of the jedi and there was nothing after that you know you had mm -hmm. so you know I. it was those were dark times for us for us star wars kids i was in high school when phantom menace uh came out and i remember being in the gym i played football i remember being in the gym and maybe it was baseball i don't remember what time of year it was probably football no i don't remember I was in the gym for some reason um, and uh, I'm lifting weights and my buddy had seen it and yeah. he was like describing it to me. He's like the Gungans and this da, da, da. <laughs> and just the new outlook on Star Wars was so exciting at that yep. moment that we were going to get this new thing. The story of Darth Vader, right? All this, all this cool stuff. And I remember just being so excited till I finally saw it in the theater. You know, I distinctly remember because I didn't get to see the original trilogy in the movies because I was too little, right? Um, so, uh, I'm, I actually just, right before we went on, sent it to my wife. I was like, they're coming back at theaters, uh, May 4th. Well, yeah. Empire, is it empires come or return? All, all nine movies oh, are really? back in theaters oh, May 4th. Oh, shoot. I thought it was just the empire return. We're coming for the, oh, that's excellent. The entire Skywalker saga oh. will be back in theaters. Nice. So I kind of want to go see the original three in theaters because I've never seen them on the big, all other six I've seen on the big screen. I've yes. never seen them I on the big screen. I was five when Star Wars came out and I remember seeing that in the drive-in still. And then, you know, key moments of like return walking into the movie theater and then they had like a frozen Han Solo there in the movie theater. It's just, yeah, it's such a great thing. I've told it on the podcast. I remember um, seeing Return of the Jedi was the first one I saw uh, because it was on at my aunt's house. Yeah. You know, for you younglings, this is before streaming television. We had to watch what was on the TV at that time. And commercials. And commercials. We wouldn't have had Cerveza Cristal memes without the commercials. <laughs> God, that was so good. Um, but I remember the color of the rug. It was this, like, hoop brown and green rug. Yeah. The the braided one. Shag? The circle or, one. Okay. No, the circular yes, one. You know yep. what I'm talking about. And I remember pulling them, pulling out the lightsabers, and I'm like, what is what is laser sword and how do I get one? Uh, and then I remember my cousin and I going out in the yard and beating the hell out of each yeah. other with sticks, pretending we had lightsabers. Yeah. Uh, and and it was all over from there. Then it was the toys. Then I had to mm -hmm. see the other movies. I have because um, I'm still redoing this room in in the next room. All of my crap is on the guest room bed, which my wife is like getting really <laughs> mad at me for. Um, but my VHS box set with Darth Vader's face is on there. Yep, I remember um, that one. Yeah, just just like stuff like that. Um, and and uh, I remember being in the movies for Attack of the Clones uh, when Yoda pulled out his lightsaber to oh, fight Dooku. Yeah, He's the theater went nuts. Yeah, theater went nuts. Everyone's screaming, yelling. I'm like, this is the greatest <laughs> thing ever. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just so many moments. And and then as you get older, it was sharing the moments with my kids has been the, exactly. The, and I'm sure yeah. you you have had this too. Was um sitting my daughter my oldest daughter down and on the couch and being like you're gonna watch them and you're gonna enjoy it and somehow none of my kids got vader ruined for them being oh, luke's wow. father so i got to experience oh, the, nice. the moment with all of them which has been yeah. incredible um and then getting to see the new movies in theaters um i saw that all three with my oldest daughter mm -hmm. i saw the first uh the second one with my son i saw episode eight with my son yeah um he's only nine um, and we decided not to let him see episode nine because Palpatine was a little too scary yep. for him at the end. Um, he's old enough now. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm excited for more Star Wars content. My son, um, when uh, Disney releases new shows, he will, because uh, sometimes if they don't do that 9 p.m. Eastern mm -hmm. release, uh, he'll, I have to get up at like five in the morning to watch because we record <laughs> at like nice. eight. And he'll get up with me and he'll sit on the couch yeah. and watch like, 
the new like bad batch or, or whatever so that's special to me too so um yeah for all the haters star wars is for kids at mm-hmm. the end of the day never forget that yeah those are george lucas's words not mine <laughs> um and enjoy it with your family because that's what disney that's why disney bought it was because they knew that my son's generation and beyond and my uncle who has the original may the force be with you pin yeah who's in the theaters like all the way stretched to there like we all enjoy it and that's what makes it special absolutely to me. like yeah and when you have kids the star wars legos the game like you know all the games you can play with them and it's just like i, I remember my son playing with his figures and he would ha- he would take his ipod and play the soundtrack as he was doing it. his battles and it's like oh that is so next level i love that yeah my son does stuff like that too yeah my daughter, my son and I just built Vader's castle like two years ago yeah. and it was on a shelf and we were rearranging his room and my youngest daughter decided to smash it. Oh, so that no. was fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was fun. I had a, I was like, ah, oh, it's gone. We're not rebuilding it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. We're gearing up now too. Cause he's almost old enough uh, to watch um, Lord of the Rings. Oh, in a few nice. Years. Yeah. So Parenting be like is so next... much fun. It can be. <laughs> This kind of stuff, I, re- I remember reading Narnia to my oldest daughter. Yeah. Uh, I read him Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe, too. Um, and it's just those moments that I really enjoy yeah. because I grew up, like I mentioned, Star Wars, even with Lord of the Rings. My mom came home. Do you remember the old Rankin Bass mm-hmm. animated Lord of the Rings? Yes. My mom came home from a garage sale with the VHS <laughs> of Return of the King. And she's like, I remember reading these books in high school. You might enjoy this movie and i popped that thing in glued i didn't know the story because it's only return of the king right i didn't have any context from fellowship i didn't have any context from two towers yeah. glued glued by the time you got to the nazgul scene i was like what is this and how do i do more of it <laughs> oh. you know and it just that took took over my you know i don't want to say my identity but right. like that's why those it laid foundation these, for that's why it's all here yeah. because it's so important to like who I am as a person yeah. and the values I have and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Going, going back to experiencing with your kids a few years ago, the, the, the uh, star Wars in concert. So they had Anthony uh, <sighs> Daniels was the MC and you know, just that was such a cool experience too. And then they had the five Oh first with it. And again, just experiencing that with your child is just, it's so next level. My, um, a- another favorite star Wars memory is, um, uh, we had gone to Galaxy's Edge right before oh, COVID, nice. like literally January before. Um, and it was just me and my wife the first time. Uh, and we went at night, so everything was lit up. And I remember walking around the corner and seeing the Falcon just sitting there oh, with like steam God. coming out. And I was like, and she's rubbing my back and she goes, you need a minute? And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> and I was like, it's there. It's there. The thing I've looked at for 40 years is right there. This is, it's, oh, oh my God. Wow. And then uh after uh 22 we went back um and my oldest daughter was with us and same reaction as yeah. dad during the day <laughs> but she turned the corner she had to pull her she pulled her mask down like this and was looked at me and went and i was like i know it's right there how cool is that <laughs> that's awesome oh. yeah and my my wife she's like i loved watching you too in that moment because you just were like she had the same face you had the first time and yeah. you were sitting there enjoying it and I was enjoying you and her to say so. <laughs> it was just, yeah, it was really, really special. I'm really happy they built that. Um, I know people, again, people hate it for no reason, right. but, and it is what it is as far as Galactic Star Cruise and all that stuff. But when you go, I don't know if you've ever been. I've have you been? never been. When you go, I want to hear your experience because it's astounding the moment you go and then building the lightsaber i've gotten to do that with with two of my kids yeah i did it myself and then i did it with each of them and it was i have both of them on video oh, it's nice. just so much fun Excellent. do that whole experience yeah. and uh yeah and uh-huh. then we go around the house doing this <laughs> <laughs> yeah earlier i misspoke about the drought of star wars between return and phantom menace we did have the timothy timothy zahn series heir to the empire which you know, they nixed it now, I guess, but Mara Jade and oh, those were that was some good good canon right there. Yeah, my my introduction to EU and Legends was Kotor. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, couldn't bring it all back to video games. I didn't know that all of this other stuff ex- I, I let me rephrase. I did know it existed. I didn't really care to look. Yep. Um, so when I was a senior in high school, uh or college, I can't remember, it was somewhere around then is when Kotor came out. And um 
actually, I think I was in college because it was December. Yeah, so that would make sense. I had just graduated. Um, and um, my friend was like, hey, new Star Wars video game. You should check it out. Put it off for a few months because um, finally got, uh, got it on Xbox. Popped it in. Oh, my God. Like, and I was like, wait, this is like canon. Like, there's there's time before. Right. Then the flood came of like comics and books. Yep. Then I read Heir to the Empire. I was actually on tour with my friend's band and I read Heir to the Empire and Dune on that tour. Oh, shoot. Um, heavy sci fi tour. Um, but uh, yeah, so I read Heir to the Empire and Dune on that tour and fell in love with Thrawn. So when Thrawn appeared in Rebels, oh, I was like, oh, what are, this is cool. Yeah. Um, and I trust Dave Filoni to do right by Thrawn. I know people are like, oh, I don't know about this. Air to the Empire is a great book, but how much of it is the memory of you reading it and experiencing that for the first time versus the content of what's actually in the book if you really right. break it down? Yep. No, that's true. Uh, yeah. And then we had the Dark Horse comics, which was a good, you know, they had good stories and then that got nixed away and whatnot. But yeah, it's, it's Star Wars is such a wonderful, wonderful universe, man. Yeah, it really is. And, and uh, you know, we're fortunate enough to have so many different playgrounds when it comes yep. to universes in Absolutely. this day and age. I mean, we all got introduced to Westeros, to, like, what was that, 12, the year I got married? 2000, <laughs> no, it was 11, 10? I wa we watched it on my honeymoon. I remember I, da I uh, not legally downloaded uh, <laughs> season one of Game of the... I own the box set now. I just want that to be known. <laughs> and I have all the books. Oh. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Westeros was such a ride. They ruined the end of it, but mm -hmm. uh, it was a ride up until then. Um, yeah. And House of the Dragon. I don't know if you saw the two trailers they no, put out today. I didn't. So they put out two trailers. They put out one for black and one for green. Oh, shoot. So one supporting each house. And they're like, pledge yourself to your house. I'm like, <laughs> I want to shake that marketing person's hand because that's genius. Yep. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, we're we're in we're in the golden age of nerddom, in my opinion. D and D oh, is cool. Um, you know, Baldur's Gate three. I didn't finish it mainly because I like playing it with people. Mm -hmm. I don't like playing four characters. I just want to play my one character when I do D and D. Yeah. So that's why I didn't finish Baldur's Gate. So if anyone out there wants to set up a game where we play weekly, <laughs> I'm all in. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, d and is cool. Lord of the Rings, more more stuff coming. Star Wars, no sign of stopping. Marvel. Yeah. Uh, it took me till the pandemic to sit down and finally like get caught up on Marvel. Yeah. So I hadn't seen Endgame. I hadn't oh, seen shoot. Infinity War. And I'm, I'm an old school comics kid, uh, mostly DC, to be honest, Batman. Yeah. Um, but I had Marvel comics and my aunt like one day just handed me a pile and she was like, here, these are from the sixties and seventies. Oh shoot. I have like old wonder woman comics and, and Supergirl and, and it's see, I was, I was more world war two haunted tank, Sergeant rock. Mm -hmm. Those were those, you know, my, my, my brother, he was all about DC and, and Batman and everything like that. But yeah. Yeah. But DC, I have, um, I have like a bunch of the graphic novels. Um, I have one signed by Frank Miller. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's cool, but Marvel, yeah, Marvel. I was late to the to the MCU party. Yeah, um, at if, if Tim will tell you, he's like, I really enjoyed Kevin texting me things that happened like three or four years ago, <laughs> like as if they were happening in real time. Yeah. Um, oh. but yeah, it's it's the golden age of nerddom. I, I don't think we've ever had it better when it comes to entertainment yep. and our options to like play in these various worlds and places and all stuff. So. Enjoy it, nerds. Enjoy yep, it. Exactly. So now after all your 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 many hats you're doing, what uh you know, what do you enjoy away from all of that? You know, obviously being a dad and any yeah. any hobbies. Um my I love cooking. Cooking is one of my favorite things yeah. to do. It's such a decomp like if I'm cooking a meal I know I'm gonna enjoy, um, I really throw myself into it. Um uh right now I'm trying to perfect my seafood. Uh, I'm, I'm really bad at fish and stuff, yeah. so I really want to get better. Um, worked on red meat for a while and, and really got steak dialed in and, and whatnot. Wings, um, uh, made these Asian gochujang style wings. Nice. Uh, and I had Tim over and my wife and Tim both said they were the best wings they've ever had. So that's a high praise right there. Um, so yeah, cooking is probably the one thing that like is the real de-stressor. Um, I love my entertainment though. I love tv shows we're yeah. watching shogun right now which is just absolutely phenomenal now will you go um, back and rewatch the original 
I so I have never seen the original, and now I'm interested to go back and see what the differences are. And then yep. people are like, "Yeah, it's a book too," and I'm like, "Oh my god, okay, Sick I got book, my work yes. cut out for me." But I'm that guy. Yeah. I have to know. I have to like. I watched Battlestar Galactica, which is also one of my favorite shows. And now hang on, to on to which watch. one? The Lauren the, Green, the original? The and no, the NBC one first. Oh, okay. Uh, and then I went and watched the Lauren Green original, and. Um, I remember talking to my mom about it because my mom's kind of a closet nerd. Yeah, she was she was very into Westerns, but she enjoyed her sci fi, um, which is why she likes Star Wars. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was uh, I was like, Mom, this is this is a little bit rough coming from that to this. Oh, God. And she was like, yeah, I forget the dog's name. And she referenced that immediately. Yeah, She's like, Daggett, really I think it was Daggett. She's like, they didn't put that in the new one, did they? I was like, no, no, they did not. This is <laughs> this is a little campy for me. So I never finished it. Yeah. Um, but I like to know. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, if it's available on streaming after this is over, I will probably go and find it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, TV TV is 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 great. Um, and uh, uh, I love uh, working out. Um, that's that's pretty much my day. Yeah. I have offline video games, too. So like right now, I told you I'm playing Helldivers. Mm-hmm. I'll dive into Dragon's Dogma. Um, but, um, you know ever so often record a YouTube video of like suicide squad. I got to finish that and Starfield. Cause again, I don't stream 40 hours a week. So right. I don't have time to finish all these. Um, and then the, the funniest one of video games and every laughs is I'm obsessed with sports games. What? Nothing wrong with, it. I grew up with hockey after our bars, you know, after going, you know, in college after the uh, bars, we get home, we'll play NHL 94 hockey. That was, I, I am obsessed with going into a game. I don't like the ultimate team modes. They don't appeal to me whatsoever. Yeah. And this is again, you'll probably uh, feel this as an old school gamer uh i love going in franchise mode picking every team playing poignant games and playoffs and things yeah. like that but putting all the sliders on auto and then seeing how players get traded and oh, moved around yeah and who signs con like for instance in baseball i think i'm on 2025 i gotta start over now the new one came out but Shoei atani went to the cleveland in- cleveland guardians <laughs> Okay. <laughs> just like stupid stuff like that that makes me excited. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Um, I remember um Madden uh this had to be Madden 20, 21. And like Brady did not retire till like 2026. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> he was like 47 or 48. Oh. I shoot. was like, this is nuts. So yeah, I just that's one of my favorite things to do is just yeah. go in. It's almost like the um what are the pen and paper ones like like out of the park baseball and stuff where you don't even actually play the game. You just do all the stats and yep. all that stuff. I'll play some of the games. But for the most part, I'm just a stat nerd. I love going in there and messing with the okay. rosters and all that stuff. Nice. So, yeah, just fun oh. stuff like that. Oh, before we uh, before we started the pod, you had a funny story. You were going to talk about how your wife how, was it. You guys got engaged or at the mar- the wedding. So we were t- we were talking about um, uh, sports teams and you were asking me about New York and stuff like that. I said, the giants are the only team that yes. brought me in my adult adult life. Cause those don't know I'm a New York giants fan, uh, New York Islanders, New York Mets, and um, the Knicks ruined basketball for me in 1994. So I haven't watched it since that they cut away from the OJ chase. They were winning the NBA championship. We came back and they've been terrible ever since. Um, uh, so yes. I hate, I don't watch basketball because of that. Um, but, <laughs> and you had a good team too. It was Starks, Ewing, uh-huh, Mason, uh-huh. Anthony Mason. Yep. Yep. Oh. And that was Charles Oakley. Yep. Uh, that was a really, really, really good team. Um, so, uh, giants, uh, first super bowl. I forget what it was in 2000. Is it the helmet we were, catch? We were not. A f- yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh man. David Tyree's helmet catch. I forget what year it was, yeah. whatever year that was. Um, my wife at the time was living here in Tampa. Her family is originally from Long Island, but they moved to Tampa when we were teenagers. We went to church together. That's how we know each other. So we just never lost touch. We stayed in touch. We both had significant others and through the years and stuff. And then when I was like dating her, you know, when you're dating, but you're not like together yet, mm-hmm. we're in that phase. But we had known each other for years. So we were still like best friends, which was weird because, you know, it's like, just, you know me. Why do we have to go through this? <laughs> so, um, she had always said there's a restaurant here in Tampa. So if you're native to Tampa, you'll know what I'm talking about. Burns Steakhouse. It's this, especially back then, it was like the elite steakhouse. And she said, whoever takes me to Burns is the man I'm marrying because three men have canceled on me in the past. And I said, all right, called Burns. I said, hey, book, book me your next open appointment. I'll fly down. They're like, cool, we have this week. Does that work for you? I'm like, yeah, what's going on that week? And they're like, well, it's Super Bowl. I'm like, I'm not going to make it to the Super Bowl. <laughs> That's not going to happen. That's 
book it. We'll be fine. <clears throat> so then the Giants play the Bucks. And at the time, like right before we started seeing each other, she had been seeing one of the guys on the Bucks. Oh, shoot. Yeah, I won't say his name, but if you go back and watch the game, you could probably figure out who it is, but based on what I'm about to say. Uh, and I will never forget. This is how this is the the dark kind of jerk side of me. Um, uh, Brandon Jacobs, the running back for the Giants at the time, ran over said player, uh, injured him <laughs> and knocked him out of the game. And I texted my not yet wife and said, mm -hmm. oh, I'm choking on irony right now. <laughs> <laughs> Giants win that game. Yeah, I'm like, cool. All right. I was like, they won't beat the Cowboys like they never beat the Cowboys. That just doesn't happen. We're doomed to lose to the Cowboys forever. Uh, and I, I remember um, Tony Romo looking like a deer in headlights at the end of that game mm -hmm. and throwing the, the, the pick. And I'm like, all right, Brett Favre and the Packers, not a chance in hell. No way. <laughs> Goes to overtime. I remember I'm at work watching it on a television and I'm like, red, and they're really giving him a run for the money, but the Packers have the ball. So we should be okay. With Brett uh, and Favre. Then with Brett Favre. Like, over time, Brett Favre going to the uh, NFC Championship? Yeah. Like, this, this is fine. Throws the pick. And I'm like, oh, my God. The Giants are in the Super Bowl, and I have dinner reservations at Burns. I'm in trouble. <laughs> so she's like, we don't have to go. I said, nope. Everyone else canceled on you. I'm not going. Uh, we're going. And she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, we are going. And she's like, okay. I flew down. We walk in. We sit down at the table. The waiter's like, um, uh, oh, good evening. Welcome to Burns. Uh, you know, guess my name. And he's like, so I guess we're not football fans. And she puts her head down like this <laughs> and he looks at her and he goes, what? And she goes, he's a diehard Giants fan. He turns to me and goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> oh my God. So I told him and he was like, ah, okay. So he made sure we had great service the entire night. Oh. Um, so he, my phone is going off and it's not just my friends. It's my mom. Like oh, she's, she's not a football. She's a baseball person. She's not a football fan. She's texting me <laughs> and she's like, Oh, Brady just scored. Like that's my phone. And she's like, you can look at it if you need to. I was like, Nope, we're here having a nice date. <laughs> so I don't even know the score. I think I checked at one point and it was like a uh, uh, 14, 10. Yeah. Um, and then um, I can hear people in the bar like groaning and making noises and stuff. And I'm just like, it's just eating at you. The David Tyree catch happens. The hell, if you don't know what I'm talking about, yeah. Google it. Holds the ball and the, just the craziest catch. The, probably the second craziest catch in NFL history. Um, immaculate reception being number one. Mm -hmm. My phone. <laughs> on the table. Not because it's not one text message. It's literally everyone I know. Right. My dad is a diehard Jets fan and he's texting me. The waiter goes like this with the check. He goes, Miss, Mr. Murray, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Puts it down on the table and goes, by the way, David Tyree just made the most amazing catch I've ever seen. Him. <laughs> She's staring at me like this. And I'm like, mm. my insides are <laughs> screaming. We walk out. I'm like, where's the valet? He's in the valet booth because he's got a little TV. Yeah. And he's like clapping and doing this. And I'm I'm like jingling my keys like to try and get his attention. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. He turns around. He walks by so I can see the TV now. There's Tom Coughlin soaking wet, ticker tape coming down. Yeah. And she's looking at me and she goes, does that mean they won? And I was like, uh-huh. <laughs> they won. I get home. My mother-in-law does not give a damn about sports. She goes, that was the greatest football oh. game I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I get my brother-in-law's like, you missed a hell of a game. But you know what? It We're was worth it. We're married. Exactly. Yep. Uh, that, that's my, if you've seen Goodwill Hunting, when he gives the ticket away to be with his, who would be his wife to yep. the game seven, six of the Red Sox World Series. That's my story. Oh, excellent. Well, you so. know what? That is a wonderful way to end this pod. <laughs> oh, man, that was awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you thank so you. much for doing this, man. It was wonderful to hear your story and meet you. But before yeah, you pleasure. go. With like past guests, I ask you to suggest somebody in your circle that would have a good story to come on. Well, you've interviewed Tim and Ben. I didn't know you. I didn't know Ben was in your circle until he was on the the pod. It's like, oh my god, this is like a mecca of content creators right there. Let me, let me, let me. Uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. That is a loaded question. There's so <laughs> many people. And you, you. I listened to the Hutch interview this morning. That was really good. His I had story. no idea. Hutch 
played for the Mets. Yeah, his story about that. having a shower with like Tim, all the pitchers. Hilarious. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> Hilarious. If I had to pick someone, have you interviewed Captain Robear yet? I, no, I don't know who that is. Oh my God. Captain Robear is the D and D guy. Okay. One of the most interesting people you'll ever meet. I will send you his information. All if right. you need an intro, let me know. Captain Robear. He did our Lord of the Rings one shot that we did. Yeah. Just an interesting person has lived like three lives. Uh, and his is, is, uh, you will have fun. All right. You'll have fun. Excellent. All right. Well, Kevin, again, thank you so much and good luck with GCX and, and everything else you're, you're a part of. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a blast. I really appreciate it.